Have you been interested in the culinary art that is barbecue but not sure where to start? Then you got to listen to Barbecue and Tech, hosted by Chris Ashley and Rod Simmons. They take you into the techniques and technology that will grow your barbecue skills. Find it at Barbecue and Tech. That's BBQ and Tech. Dot com. Coming up on DTNS, highlights from the Facebook papers, a roundup of Tesla news, and cryptocurrency has a big moment. It may even be for real now, folks. DTNS starts now! This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, October 25th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And I'm Allison Sheridan of the Podfeed Podcast. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. We were sharing a lot of our opinions about a movie about sandworms, Tremors, on Good Day Internet. You can get that wider conversation by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. And that's where you can join our top patrons like Dale Mulcahy, Scott Hepburn, and Bjorn Andre. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Well, NVIDIA's GeForce Now game, stre game streaming service works in the Microsoft Edge browser now. This means you can now use the service on an Xbox One and Series XS console if they're updated to the Chromium-based version of Edge. Speaking of Microsoft, Microsoft announced the Nobelium Threat Group, previously behind the SolarWinds supply chain attack, breached at least 14 managed service and cloud providers since May 2021. Overall, Microsoft said 609 customers were notified of 22,868 attacks between July and October, although Nobelium saw a low single-digit success rate. Amazon announced new programs to integrate its voice assistant into hospitals and senior living communities. Senior living facilities can now use Echo devices to send announcements and messages to residents' rooms, and residents can also use the devices to place calls. In hospitals, Echo devices can be used for nurses to communicate with patients. Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, Bay Care Health Systems in Florida, and Houston Methodist are among the announced partners. Twitter engineer Mata Aflock initially showed off a way to show NFTs on a Twitter profile back in September. Now reverse engineer Jane Manchin Wong found updates to these efforts in code that is part of Twitter's mobile app. This includes a dedicated collectibles profile tab for NFTs, a view to provide a close-up look at NFTs, and a detailed information screen. The collectibles tab looks to take the place of the likes tab on a profile if they implement it. The Swiss Federation, the Swiss Federal Administration Court upheld an appeal filed by Proton AG, the parent company of Proton Mail ruling that email services are not telecommunications providers in Switzerland. This means email providers are not subject to requirements to store data necessary for surveillance. The Swiss Supreme Court ruled in April that email, chat, IM, and VoIP providers were over-the-top providers, not telecom services. All right, let's get into the Facebook papers, folks. And let me tell you, uh, there's more than a dozen news outlets uh, publishing stories based on these documents. We are not going to cover them all. You are definitely going to not hear us talk about what you think is the most important one of these, because there's too many of them. Uh, but I, I picked a selection that I think give you a good overview if you haven't heard any of these stories, or at least point out uh, particular trends in the kinds of stories in here. Uh, if you're not quite sure what I'm talking about, Friday, Multiple news outlets published stories about Facebook's policies and reactions based on documents that had been provided to the U.S. Congress and SEC. The stories are collectively being referred to as the Facebook Papers. Most of the stories are based on documentation provided by former Facebook employee Frances Haugen. She gave those documents to Congress and to the SEC and to these news outlets. The reports provide more examples of previous allegations that Facebook prioritizes growth over safety and that it does not apply its moderation practices equally, something Haugen said to the U.S. Congress and said to the U.K. Parliament uh, just today. All right, some, some show the company being slow. Facebook employees raised concerns about vaccine hesitancy in March 2021, but it took six months for the company to create and implement new rules. Like most people, they were taken by surprise by the events of January 6th at the U.S. Capitol as well. Sometimes they knew a problem existed and took no action. A policy set up in October 2020 to stop recommending civic and political groups to users was found not to be working because it only looked at the last seven days of posts to decide if a group qualified as a civic or political organization on an ongoing basis. It might have been a civic organization, but if it had seven days of posts without that, then it dropped out of that block list. Several groups then 
gamed the system by posting non-political items long enough to pop back up into recommendations. And Facebook has not appeared to fix that one. So that that's kind of a little bit of a mixture there, right, Tom? What, we're talking about them being slow and bureaucratic like any big company, and then knowing about a problem and not taking action. But that's we were sort of almost into a third category there of where they did a fix, but they did it poorly. And now they know that it's not working and they're not fixing it yet. Right. They, they, they did something that they thought would help fix, but when it was shown not to be effective, they didn't go back and fine tune it. Right. 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 Yeah. So we're almost into a third dimension of poorly managed so far. Uh, sometimes they also needed to be pushed. Apple threatened to remove Facebook and Instagram from the App Store on October 23rd, 2019, after a BBC News Arabic report on Instagram being used to sell domestic workers. Facebook had been aware of the content, but less than 2% of the content had been reported by users. So they didn't think it was very widespread, they say. After Apple, after Apple escalated the issue, however, Facebook disabled 1,021 accounts and removed 129,121 pieces of content. So, <laughs> so that's there. There's somehow that much content and that many accounts, but because less than two percent of the content had been reported by users, that's why they didn't do anything about it. Part, yeah, part of this is I think it's easy to get in the headspace of Facebook. There, there's Mr. Facebook. Uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Facebook sits there and he knows everything on Facebook. But if only 2% of people are reporting it, he's going to be like, eh, it's not that big of a problem. And you're sitting there going, even if 2% are reporting, you should look into this. But the problem is there isn't a Mr. Facebook. There's you know several thousand Facebook employees. And they all can't do everything because Facebook has billions of users. So I think it's legitimate for Facebook to say, if something's being reported at a low amount, we have to prioritize and address the things are, that are being reported at a higher amount first. It's not that they only had this problem that day and ignored it. It's that it didn't get up on their radar because it was being reported less often than other problems, would be my so guess. In, in project management, one of the things you do when you're doing risk assessment is you not only look at, at what the, uh, the, the, the uh, probability of that risk is, which would be like this 2% thing, but you look at the implications of that risk. So selling humans, I would suggest, would be high on, on that second category, even though sure. it's only 2%. But Selling you might also have 10 one. other things that are higher in that same category, like terrorism, et cetera. Well, Remember, yeah. Facebook has all of the human behaviors that you can think of on it. Yeah, I guess I thought I, I guess I thought selling people would be really high, but yeah, you're right. I, I'm not trying worse. to say selling people no. is not high. I'm just saying right. they have so many things that are high. I could see them missing it. On the other hand, they could have seen this BBC News Arabic report as easily as Apple, right? Right. right. They have to wait for Apple to threaten them before they investigated that. Right. I don't know. Right. Uh, sometimes they tried something and it worked. A team tested a new classification called Harmful Topic Community for an aggressive anti-lockdown and anti-vax group in Germany. That test led to a new policy uh, called Coordinated Social Harm in September. Uh, so that is actually a piece of, of effective uh, behavior out of this. Some internal Facebook research showed that super inviters could quickly rebuild a group after it was banned. Facebook has since changed a policy that prohibits persistent violators of its policies from creating groups or inviting people to other groups. So once you get caught once, you can't be released to start another group. You're you're done for that. Uh, there were lots of examples of employees feeling overwhelmed by the situation. You'll see a lot of that. This is the, the less scientific part of it, just people feeling freaked out about what they're a part of. Politico quoted an employee saying in October 2019, if we really want to change the state of our information ecosystem, we need a revolution, not an evolution of our systems. If you don't have enough good content to boost, it doesn't matter how much you downrank the bad. The biggest examples of prioritizing growth over safety came around likes and reshares. Plans to hide like counts on Instagram were shelved because tests showed they hurt ad revenue. And there was a worry that if Facebook didn't hide likes and Instagram did, Facebook wouldn't look good next to Instagram. So Instagram instead let people choose to hide likes if they want, but it doesn't hide them by default. Some employees recommended killing the reshare button altogether or limiting promotion of reshared content in the newsfeed to only those from your close friends. But Facebook's head of ads, John Hageman, objected, noting that, quote, if we remove a small percentage of reshares from people's inventory, they decide to come back to Facebook less. 
<laughs> Shocking, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, a clear example of like, yeah, that might help, but it'll hurt our bottom line, so don't do it. Uh, CEO yeah. Mark Zuckerberg allegedly stopped a plan to run Spanish language voter registration on the platform for fear it would appear partisan. Facebook did run English language voter registration, and WhatsApp partnered with someone to run Spanish language, but they didn't run it themselves. So Mr. Facebook did make that decision. Well, they yeah, part a very important piece of Mr. Facebook made that decision in that case. Uh -huh. Uh, Bloomberg reported that Facebook's engagement metrics among young users have been falling and that the company may not be properly accounting for multiple accounts run in order to hide certain posts, so-called finstas, uh, from parents and families. Haugen alleges Facebook is misrepresenting its core metrics to investors and advertisers because of this. Facebook responded to that, saying it already notifies advertisers of the risk that purchases will reach duplicate, account, duplicate accounts. So they're saying, yeah, that's say, baked in. After watching the um, the testimony uh, by Francis Haugen, um, I actually got rid of Facebook and Instagram off all my devices. I haven't officially quit, but you didn't delete your account. You just got rid of the apps. Is that, am I? Is that right? Right, right. Mm -hmm. to, I'm trying it on to see how it feels, and you know what? It feels fine. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, in fact, more and more people may be doing that. Uh, Francis Haugen decided to release these all at once, decided to work with news organizations to flood the market. Now, that's different than what uh, we saw happen with uh, Edward Snowden, where he leaked his things out slowly so that each one got its own news cycle. Haugen did that because she wanted all of these out there, not only the day of Facebook's earnings report, but also the week of Facebook Connect, where they're going to un unveil their metaverse strategy. Uh, an interesting way of going about this. And Facebook earnings did come out today. Uh, they missed their estimates on revenue because of the slowdown in ads uh, based on tracking restrictions that have been put in place in iOS. And they also uh, had virtually no user growth during the past quarter. Wow. Monthly active users worldwide for Facebook hit 2.91 billion, up 7% on the year, but flat sequentially. So quarter to wow. quarter, they didn't gain any. That's really interesting. All right, changing topics. We've got a big one here. MasterCard announced a deal with the cryptocurrency firm Backed to provide crypto options for merchants and banks on its payment network. Banks and merchants that work with MasterCard will be able to use Backed's technology to buy, sell, and hold cryptocurrency in a Backed provided wallet. And MasterCard partners, including not just banks, but restaurants and other merchants could offer loyalty rewards in cryptocurrency as well as convert existing rewards like airline and hotel points into crypto. The idea is to keep customers from moving to crypto exchanges like Coinbase. There's more than 2.8 billion active MasterCards and more than 22,000 banks and financial institutions on MasterCard's network. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say how this will end up appearing to you as a customer, because what MasterCard is doing is saying, we're working with back to make this available. If you're a bank, if you're a restaurant, anybody that works with MasterCard, you can now take advantage of it, but it doesn't mean you will, right? So not every restaurant will take Bitcoin because of this, but some restaurants might, or they might just start giving you cryptocurrency as a loyalty reward if you continually go to that restaurant and pay with your MasterCard, stuff like that. Uh, but definitely there will be banks that will uh, be able to issue a debit card that lets you access your Bitcoin wallet, uh, for example. And, and like you said, Allison, it's they want to keep they basically MasterCard is the first big uh, traditional finance company to look at Coinbase and all of these other wallets and exchanges and say, you know what, that's actually a real business. And if we don't move now, uh, everyone will go to them and we'll be left behind. So I'm still trying to picture exactly how this would work. Let's say CVS, who does royalty like uh, royalty loyalty like anybody yeah, else, yeah. Um, they 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 take Mastercard and they want to get in on this. Is that where I go buy toilet paper and instead of giving me CVS extra bucks for a dollar, they're going to give me a dollar in cryptocurrency that's going to go into my backed wallet? Yeah, that that sounds like one of the things they could do. Okay. Uh, I imagine there's other things they could do, which is like let you then spend that cryptocurrency from that wallet into CVS mm -hmm. without necessarily taking Bitcoin. But they could say like, oh, we're just using this cryptocurrency as the way to track your loyalty points now. 
Oh, okay, um, okay. And then maybe you could convert that because it's already a cryptocurrency and say, actually, I just want to make that Bitcoin and then sell it. And they're, you know, that would be an advantage to their loyalty program is you could cash out your points that way. So one of the advantages of, of using crypto was, uh, well, obviously of the authentication portion of it, but wasn't there some elimination of the uh, the speed of transfer of money between organizations? Is that, or am I mixing that yeah, up with something and so, else? And so that is a different that is a different aspect than this. This is Mastercard saying, "Hey, clients, banks, and restaurants." Would you like to offer some cryptocurrency related things to your customers? What you're talking about is the banks transferring money between each other to say, let's cut out the fees. Now, there may be an ele element of MasterCard operating this and saying, and we'll also do some you know, fee reduction elements uh, on the point of sale terminals and, and whatnot if we transfer through cryptocurrency. That's not addressed in any of these, these okay. articles about it. Uh, but yeah, that's a separate thing where they use cryptocurrency to to settle transactions faster and with fewer fees. Um, but this this is mostly not about that. This is mostly about giving you cryptocurrency on your end. And frankly, I, because nobody's doing it yet, it's we don't know exactly how it will be used okay. most commonly. It sounds almost like MasterCard is saying, okay, you have this toolbox of things yeah. you can do. Now you have another tool. So yeah. when you're ready to take that on, we're already here. We've got backs. We're ready to go. We can offer that that service to you as well. Yeah, let's say uh, your your bank works with MasterCard. Your bank could, could just come out with a wallet, cryptocurrency wallet. Say, hey, don't use Coinbase. Use your bank. We're your bank. Use us. You can have okay. all, your, all your cryptocurrencies with us. And then MasterCard is providing the back end. You might not ever even realize that. All your crypto belong to us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a few bits of Tesla news out there. I know uh, you both uh, have a dog and a car that go by Tesla. <laughs> Yes. Uh, Allison's dog's named Tesla, and she drives a Tesla. Uh, first up, the company got an early Christmas present from Hertz Rental Car, which announced the single largest EV purchase ever, buying 100,000 Tesla Model 3 sedans. Of course, rental car agencies need cars because people are starting to rent them again. There's a shortage. Uh, these will be delivered over the next 14 months. For some context on how big this is, Hertz reported its global fleet size in Q4 2020 at roughly 568,000. So this is about a sixth of its entire fleet. These will be available to rent in major US markets and part of Europe by early November. Size of the order is about a tenth what Tesla can currently produce in a year. Customers will have access to Tesla's charging network with Hertz, building out its owner charger infrastructure. Uh, if you want to buy a Tesla yourself, you're going to have to pay a little more. Base Model S and X vehicles now start at $5,000 more than they did, while the Model 3s and Ys are up $2,000. Uh, there was no reason given for the increase, but continued supply chain woes might be one cause. Monday, Automotive News reported that Panasonic has released details of a new battery it has developed for Tesla. These are not lithium iron phosphate batteries. Those are made by LG and CATL for Tesla. However, Panasonic did announce that it will have five times the energy storage, which could be good for your vehicle range, and Panasonic believes it'll cost 50% less to produce. They didn't tell us any of the details of the chemistry, though. And you may have heard over the weekend that Tesla briefly rolled back its full self-driving beta 10.3 software. They reverted it to 10.2, but now they have released version 10.3.1. CEO Elon Musk said the company was seeing some issues. He didn't detail what they were. The Verge noted some anecdotal reports of phantom forward collision warnings, a disappearing auto steer option, traffic-aware cruise control problems, occasional what they call autopilot panic, where it just kind of freaks out on you. No indication that these were widespread or indeed the cause of the rollback, if they were, but the rollback has now been rolled forward, so... Do you, do you have this yet? Did you get into the beta? So, um, oh, I have so many thoughts on so many of these things, but uh, no, I have not. Um, Steve and I are both, uh, both have Teslas and we've both did, been running the uh, safety test, which is it watches you for several different metrics. Oddly ah, right. enough, you can speed as fast as you want. You can accelerate like a, a bat out of heck. Um, but you can't turn quickly. Uh, you can get uh, collision avoidance warnings. Those are uh, those are terrible. If you get those, you don't have a chance. So I went from 99 to like 71 because it gave me a, a, one of those warnings. Um, I've managed to inch my way back up to 94 out of 100, but it's sort of like trying to get your GPA up in the fourth quarter, you know, yeah, yeah. the last year. It's, it's, it's quite a climb. Um, I'm really glad that they rolled back a beta if it had some problems. And doesn't this just read like, company put out a beta product, uh, found some issues, rolled it back, and then fixed them and rolled it forward? 
Yeah, which is what you want. I, I think people yeah. still get freaked out that it's like, my car is in beta. I might crash. Um, and, and so that, that's the what beta. they hear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and that's the thing is you shouldn't run the beta. And, and B, none of these seem to have caused issues. They were... They were quirks that made it hard to use the program. And like you said, they did the right thing. Rolled it back, fixed them, rolled them back out. And, and remember, all of this you can completely control by holding your hands on the steering wheel and using that brake and accelerator stuff. That's all still there in the car. So yeah. it's not like you don't have control of this and your car is going to just fly off the handle and do stuff on its own. Um, on the uh, on the EV rental thing uh, by Hertz, I thought that was really interesting. Um, listening to Bodie Grimm's uh, uh, Kilowatt podcast, he talked about a company in Germany that was renting out EVs, and they eventually got rid of all of their EVs that weren't Teslas because nobody would ever rent them. And <laughs> and I thought that was, I mean, that's really odd because there's some terrific uh, EVs out there other than Teslas. Uh, but that would kind of point towards why maybe Hertz is going just Teslas too. Yeah, uh, there's, there's something to be said for branding, you know. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I Elon would Musk rather, is a genius at that. I would rather there was variety because I'd like to go on travel and rent a different kind of EV. I want to try out some. And of try these it out because you already drive a Tesla. You know what that's like. Yeah. That yeah, makes and, sense there, and there's some yeah. really cool. I listen to Bodhi and I hear about all these cool options. So um, I'm definitely interested in that. The last thing I wanted to say was the the price changes are so interesting. Tesla's the only car company I've ever dealt with that is just constantly changing the price and the functions of the car. So if you buy a Model 3 on Tuesday and somebody else buys one on Friday, it might actually have different features. They're they're different. They, you don't know what you're going to get exactly in this string of features, which is unsettling. But uh, I don't know. It's a cool car. It, it seems to me that a price increase story for Tesla is a story because Tesla has fixed prices. Mm. Whereas even though there's an MSRP on cars, I, I may be wrong about this, but I feel like Car companies don't change the MSRP. They just change what they charge the dealers, and then the dealers change how they deal uh, to make up the difference. Whereas Tesla, it's like, you know the price. That's what you're going to pay. Done. Right. You don't know what's in it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, folks, uh, if you want to talk about Tesla, you want to talk about rental cars, you want to talk about the Facebook papers, uh, join in the conversation in our Discord. You can get that by linking it to your Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. <laughs> Apple's new MacBook Pros are shipping. I'm getting mine tomorrow. So is my wife. So is Allison. Uh, so, so is Allison's husband. Uh, <laughs> and the first reviews have started to hit the web. If you're thinking of getting one of these machines, if you're starting to see all these reviews and you're like, hold on, okay, maybe I'll try to get one. I guess I'll wait to December to have it shipped. But how do I make sense of all the options? Allison has put together something to help you make that decision. This this is brilliant, Allison, your flowchart. Tell us about it. Yeah, so when when the uh, announcement came out, like Tom uh, and, and Eileen and Steve, we were we were all just sitting with our fingers poised above the keyboard, ready to order right away. And so when we got it, we went, uh, uh, top of the line, and we pressed all the buttons, and we got day, day and date delivery. So we're excited. Um, but we didn't have the time to sit back and really look at all the different model differences. What's the difference between the M1 Pro and the M1 Max? And I decided to start just kind of trying to put it together to see if I could understand the model differences. And uh, as I went into it, I realized a spreadsheet wasn't going to be the way to explain it, which is where I always start things. So then I moved into a mind mapping application, and then that couldn't even do it. I ended up going into uh, using a tool called diagrams.net, uh, which lets you basically do little flow charts. And I tried to describe in something very simple all the different configurations, but it became more and more complex as I went along. So basically, you have two trees you're looking at. One is uh, the M1 Pro and one is the M1 Max. And then it starts breaking down into the different number of CPU cores you can get. And once you break down into CPU cores, it changes how many GPU cores you can get. And once you're down into that, then you, it changes how much RAM you can put in it. And then it turns out certain models, which I did, definitely didn't realize at the beginning, are only available as 14-inch. I think there's three, if I remember correctly. I'm not staring at it right now. So I've got a separate boxes to try to show, okay, this group of things are, you can only get in 14 inch, this can be 14 or 16. And then one of the models of the 14 inch, uh, we actually learned on DTNS has two different power supplies you can do. So when I got all done, I had 18 different configurations you could actually buy. 
And then uh, I realized all of a sudden, oh, wait a minute, I forgot about the, the uh, disk size you could put in it. There's five different disk options, which means uh, you actually have uh, 90 different configurations you can choose from. And after I was finished talking about this on my show, during my live show, Steve piped in and goes, Allison, we forgot color. So there's actually 180 <laughs> different combinations that you can choose from. But I think what, what I tried to do was break this down in a way that you can look at it and you can follow down a path and go, okay, I want to be here. Yeah, it, it's great. I mean, at a glance, I, I was realizing things that I knew but hadn't really thought about, like the fact that uh, the M1 Max only has the 24 and 32 core GPUs, like just being able to see that separated uh, in, in your map here uh, was great. And then, you know, all the different RAM options uh, and the way the GPUs and the cores of the CPUs flow together. Uh, this is great. We'll have a link to it in our show notes at dailytechnewsshow.com. And of course, you could just go to podfeed.com and find it there as well. However, that's not the only thing you've been working on. Uh, you also recently updated your Time Shifter web app, which may I say I am uh, very excited about because it's it's something I need, which is how to figure out what time it is for people in three or four different locations around the globe at the same time. More than that, in the future. It's knowing what time it will be in the future. So Exactly. It's pretty... I need to schedule a meeting next Tuesday at 6 p.m. for me. What does that mean for Helsinki, Tokyo, and London? Your, your time shifter clock can do that for me. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, this was the result or the evolution from a project I started on the uh, um, Programming by Stealth podcast taught by Bart Bouchatz and me as the student in the class. And uh, it, it's it's pretty cool. You can add, I, I put no limit to how many cities you can add. Uh, Dorothy tested it up to, I think, 30, and it didn't stop. So you can add as many cities as you want. You drag a little slider until it says the time you want in your time zone, and then it's changing the time in all these other time zones, and then you hit uh, copy URL. And at that point, you can paste that into an email, and anybody who clicks it sees all of the times in all of the cities exactly as it was when you uh, when you created it. So if you need to schedule meetings with people all across the globe, I think it's a pretty handy tool. I've been using an app called Time Scroller on iOS since you recommended it to me like 15 years ago. Yes, uh, yes. So, so this is great. This is going to be a nice, nice little upgrade uh, yeah, over so that because it's available on the web for free. And you can put it on. You can make it on your home screen on your iOS oh, uh, device, yeah, so it right. looks like a web app. See, Very except cool. an ugly logo. <laughs> Hey, folks, uh, if you're thinking about taking a cruise on your next trip, well, you're not me, but that's cool. I respect that. Uh, maybe you're just interested in a bit of ship spotting. You want to see where the cruise ships are and not get on one. I I'm with you there. Well, either way, Chris Christensen, the amateur traveler, has the perfect app for you. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. This tip comes via the This Week in Travel podcast that I was a co-host on for about 10 years, and it's VesselFinder.com. It's an interesting site because it helps you find ocean-going ships. So, for instance, if you were on a cruise ship and you're wondering where that cruise ship is now, you can use VesselFinder.com to find it. This summer, I was on the Windstar Starbreeze, and I was able to find that ship is now in French Polynesia using this site. It has other applications, not just for travel. If you want to see how screwed up the supply chain is, just use Vessel Finder's map and zoom in on Long Beach, California, and see those ships piled up. So whether you're trying to find where that cruise ship is or some other ship, VesselFinder.com. And this is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. I mean, just to look at the Long Beach backup alone, I think that, that's worth it. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> uh, Allison, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do that, Tom. I was listening. To, uh, let's see. Our, our first article is from uh, from Nick. He wrote in, I was listening to DTNS 4134, and everyone seemed a little surprised by the Snapchat integration into the Pixel 6. I think this is probably because Snapchat is a heavy Google Cloud platform user, kind of like how Microsoft saw TikTok as a potential boon for Azure when they were considering buying them. I think Snapchat is currently a success story for GCP. On another note, I just want to thank you all for the show. I started listening to, to Tech News Today when I was about 10 years old and jumped over to DTNS when that launched. It helped foster my interest in both tech and science, and I have now just finished the first month of my PhD in computer science. I think the work you and the team do has made an important impact on my life, so I wanted to share that. Also, hi from New Zealand. 
<laughs> ah, hi, Nick. Uh, thank you. That That's wonderful. I really appreciate you adding that, that second paragraph. And your point about uh, Snapchat and Google Cloud Platform makes perfect sense to me. Uh, if Snapchat is a a successful Google Cloud Platform user, it would be in Google's best interest to be like, hey, what else can we partner with? And they, a lot of times that's how these other conversations uh, get rolling. So uh, good insight there as well. Thank you for that. Keep those emails coming. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Real quickly, want to thank our brand new boss. Uh, all you patrons, please welcome brand new boss, and uh, Brandon, Brandon Boyle. <laughs> Brandon Boyer just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Brandon. Oh, Brandon. Uh, and if, if you would like to be uh, shouted out and welcomed into the fold tomorrow, we'll start backing us. Patreon.com slash DTNS. Thank you, Allison Sheridan, for being here today. Uh, Sarah Lane uh, should be back in the next few weeks. Uh, we wish her well. She's she's doing great. I was texting with her over the weekend. But it's great to have you here, Allison. Thank you so much. Real quick, where can people find more of what you got going on? Well, everything good starts with podfeet.com. And you can follow me on Slack at, or on Slack on Twitter at podfeet. <laughs> All right. We are live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. You can find out more about that at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with Rich Straffolino and Trisha Hirschberg. Talk to you later. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>